It's Tuesday, November 13th, Dateline, November 1st. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, The Burning Con 2012. Let's do this. Shows up a little bit late. Scott was too much of a wuss to uh, bike through the hurricane to come over to the studio to do yeah, Geek Nights. Yeah, listen, you know. I was out biking. Both those days and running. Oh, uh, listen, you have hair warming your head. There's things called hats. In fact, it's Tuesday. Team Fortress 2 might have taught you about them if do you, you didn't know otherwise. Do you own any hats that also that go underneath helmets in a safe fashion? Uh, they make a couple of different kinds of hats that do that. How much do those cost? I don't know. Yeah, see, I went to REI. You could just not also, wear a helmet. And also EMS. Just put on a knit hat instead. And I was looking at the prices on equipment that would allow me to bike. When it, see, I don't want to bike in the snow. Even though I looked into that, too, you can get studded tires No, it sucks. Shit. It sucks. It's yeah. not fun. Never, ever bike in the snow. If you had the right kind of bike. No, it's, it's still not, not fun. So, I've had the right kind of bike. It's not <laughs> I fun. I don't want to bike in the rain or snow. I mean, for no other reason. At least I've biked it. How about sleet? You okay with sleet? In any sort of precipitation. Dark of night? Especially not hail. Because uh, I have biked in the rain, and though even though it, you know it's perfectly fine for in a lot of ways, the mere fact, even if you have a fender, you're gonna get water. Oh no, you're gonna look like you. shit when you get wherever you're right, going. So whatever you're wearing is ruined <laughs> if you have to bike in the rain. So uh, I don't want to do that. But I thought, hey, I do want to bike, no matter how cold it is, even if it's like below zero. So get I a should nice be able to bike helmet. if it is not raining or snowing so, or uh, precipitating. You could just not wear a helmet. I often don't wear a helmet. So I went and I w- looked at the equipment. Well, even if you don't wear a helmet, there's still the issue of, you know, the part of your body covered in coats will melt because you're sweating in it. And the part uh, of your that- body that is exposed will freeze because there's wind blowing. So you know what it. that means? You have a really terrible coat. You got to go and get specialized coats. Yeah, you know what I had? For all, this. The, all the stuff I use for skiing. Yeah. So I went to REI and EMS and investigated the situation to see what kind of equipment I could get that would allow this sort of activity. And they had some of that equipment. And that equipment was horrendously expensive. I don't recall it being that expensive for oh, stuff like that. Oh, Mr. Vice President doesn't <laughs> think that a $500 coat is expensive. I spent. 380 on my that ski is, jacket. That is more than hundreds. That ski jacket is going to last me another 15 hundreds. years. Hundreds. Now, I'm, and that's just the jacket. We're ta- talking, we're not even started talking also, about the Also, you underclothes. don't need a jacket that expensive for what you're doing. We're talking about the underclothes, too. Well, remember, this is retail price in Manhattan. Get so. some, like, <laughs> stupid Uniqlo Heat Tech t-shirts. They work great, and they're, yeah. like, 15 bucks. Yeah, so... You know, I was looking a lot of this stuff, and to buy enough to wear every day to go to work all the time would add up to many hundreds. Or you could just not care and show up to work looking like whatever. Or I could just not bike when it's fucking cold out. That sucks. Uh, It doesn't suck too bad. (laughs) Anyway. Um, No frostbite here. Pretty good. Uh, the only time Doing I ever pretty good. almost got frostbite is when I was hiking out in the woods and the blizzard got lost, uh, fell through a creek, and my boot broke. Uh, I'm scoring 100% on the no frostbite scale. Okay. But, no uh, complaints here. I did go biking yesterday, but anyway, uh, this episode's a little bit late. Uh, as I said, dateline November 1st, but uh, we missed a Tuesday show. Due to various reasons we just discussed. So uh, this isn't actually going up for a week and a half from Mm. when we're recording this. Oh, well. So it's Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I heard a game came out. I heard a couple games came out. Yeah, after waiting for over a decade, perhaps yes, longer than... Uh, longer than the Team Fortress 2 wait. I waited longer for Team Fortress 2. That's true. Well, we, we haven't really, you know... I have so been waiting so long because this one is, you know, unlike, say, Duke Nukem Forever, right? Duke Nukem Forever, it would be like there'd be some screenshots and there'd be nothing. There'd be an E3, there'd be nothing. And then it would kept coming and disappearing, coming and disappearing, and appearing and reappearing and then disappearing for long periods of time. This game has appeared and stayed appeared without disappearing, you know, with, with relatively frequent, you know, news updates and no black holes or mis- mysteries for about a decade. And now it is out. I have not the fancy beta. black armor because I gave them $40. Yeah. It is 100% out, Natural Selection 2. And actually, I haven't played it in months. Uh, <laughs> so, neither have I. <laughs> yeah. But I want to, but I'm busy on other things. I haven't even played Counter-Strike. Me either. I wonder why. Not, we'll, we'll in, talk not in, the, in weeks. We'll talk in the meta why that is. But yeah, we haven't played NS2, but you know what? 
every time I played it had been a market improvement over the previous time I had played it. Now and it has like mechs and shit, and wow, well, man, it's off the hook. It was several months ago. And when apparently it, all kinds of network issues are fixed. It reached the point where it was actually, at that point, more fun than the original NS, which took a while to get uh, to. Th- I don't know, well... It was it was equalish, different but equalish. Yeah, different, but it was more fun to play. Partly just because a lot more people, it was easier to get a game going. There's other factors there. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'd still be playing Weapons Factory, but you know what? There's no goddamn way to play Weapons Factory <laughs> except with nut jobs who were so much better than me. It wouldn't even matter. <laughs> be like if chess were a forgotten art. And I wanted to play. Well, only the hardcore crazy dude. If everyone else chess. on if everyone else on Earth forgot chess, but me. I could be the best. Because <laughs> I'd still remember the rules, and I've played it more times. And uh, That might not actually be to your advantage. And two, you and I should play Bobby Fischer chess, because that eliminates all opening study as a factor. Do you know about Bobby Fischer chess? That's a, You know what? It's in that book. That the wouldn't Richard matter Garfield to me. You should be reading. That wouldn't matter to me, because I've never learned any of the chess openings. I have learned three to a reasonable degree. I am partial to the Polish opening, but everyone good I've ever played with told me I'm stupid for using it, and I don't understand it well enough to understand why. Okay. But yeah, uh, do you know what Bobby Fischer chess is? Uh, it's something where you shuffle up all the pieces, right? No, so, no you shuffle the back row uh-huh. only. So that row is just randomized and equivalent on both well, sides. Well, shuffling up the front row wouldn't really do much now. But you can shuffle up everything, so maybe there's a pawn in the back. <laughs> that would be kind of I'd like that. But that then a pawn suck. would not be able to do shit if it was caught behind. The Pawns side. can barely do shit in the front. <laughs> I know. I've also realized that most people I've known in my life, like everyone who's a gamer seems to know the rules of chess and that they know how the pieces move. But I'm starting to realize that most people I know don't actually know all the rules of chess. They cannot describe how castling works, nor have they ever heard of en passant. If they're, okay, so castling is when the rook and the uh, the king, right, are sort of, don't have anything in between them, right? Yep. In which case, then you move the rook two spaces to the right, and then you move the king to the other side of the rook. He, like, jumps over him. All right, here's the trick and question. And that's it. That's all the castle is. is can, you go, you, can you castle if the rook had moved out of that position and later returned to it? I have no idea, but I will guess no. So more important, not more important because it never happens, but more crazy. Can you castle if the king moved out of the position and moved back into it? I'm looking it up because I actually don't remember. Right. But the thing is, castling never comes up among... Like, it's weird. Like, really? Do, do really do pros ever castle? So from what I gather, yes. What I've noticed, and I read an article about this, really inexperienced players castle way more often than anyone mm. because... Well, if they know about the rule existing, you got to try they it. They go for it because it seems cool and weird. Of course. Wouldn't you? That's the reason that you buy all the weird buildings in Kalis. But uh, en passant is the rule that I think most people who play chess in the world have never heard of. Well, isn't that the one where like all the pawns are lined up against each other so you can kill the pawn in a weird way? It has to do with the fact that way back in the day, you know, not, not there's no original rules of chess really, but basically there was no move a pawn t- two spaces at the beginning of the game rule. Right. So the game took longer. So eventually this was kind of a, a house rule where you could say, all right, you can move a pawn forward twice. But to get around the fact that that could actually change the game, if a pawn moved two and there was another pawn like in front of it, it can move at an angle to where the pawn would have been if that rule weren't in place and capture it like that instead of landing directly on it. Mm-hmm. That's it. I don't think that comes up much in professional play, if at all. Uh, I don't know anything about really professional chess. Oh, so I'm I don't pretty, even know any openings. I'm pretty shit at chess. <laughs> Partly because uh, I'd study those openings, but... Uh, I don't really play. If I against... recall, like the few, very few times you played chess, I've actually won despite not knowing anything except the rules and how to move guys. Ah, castling is important goal in early parts of chess, according to Wikipedia. Okay. Good. Okay. Anyway. anyway. So uh, another game. So yeah, came NS2. Up. <laughs> NS2. You, you I... should. If you really haven't bought it already, I don't know what the hell's wrong with you or what podcast you've been listening to, uh, but really. We're talking, if you're the kind of person who is dying in Counter-Strike all the time, and maybe you don't like it, I mean, really, you know, and sometimes you're not in a Counter-Strike mood. Sometimes you need something a little different. You should really have Counter-Strike Go and NS2, and that will pretty much satisfy all of your multiplayer team-based FPS needs for the rest of your life. There was a time in my life when I would play Counter-Strike until I was sick of it, and then I would just immediately play NS until I was sick of it. And go back to Counter-Strike. Pretty much. Right, so just have those two games. If you have any two games on Steam, have those two, and 
really, dude. I mean, you could almost argue you don't need any other games. <laughs> Except maybe Super Metroid. And, and FTL. Man too. Yeah, but you don't really need FTL, but it's good. I need FTL. I really like FTL. Mm. I look forward to some sort of expansion or yeah. versus version. Well, let me, let's just say this. A year from now, FTL play, not going to get so many hours. A year from now, NS2 and Counter-Strike still going to get clicked on. Ah, but they're different classes of game entirely. I'm just saying. Staying power these games are, have their own like, these separate are, class. These are life games. These aren't those games where you buy them, play them, and put them away. These are life games. There's only two of them. One of them just came out. This is a big deal. Castling is permissible if and only if the following conditions still hold. Here we go. One, the king has not previously moved. Uh, Two, the chosen rook has not previously moved. Uh, so, yeah, that's that. Three. I guess so. I guessed right. Three, there are no pieces between the king and the chosen rook. Okay. Four, the king is not currently in check. Five, the king does not pass through a square that is under attack Wait, by Wait, you can't do pieces. it when you're in check? Nope. Oh, but that's like the best time when you'd want to do it. Yeah. Oh, that's bullshit. The king does not pass through a square that is under attack by enemy pieces. Six, the king wait, does wait, not I end up in check. He does check. not pass through a square that is under attack. So if one of the spaces between the king could, and the rook could be hit by, say, a knight. You can't castle. Oh. it's That's very similar to the Ampassant rule, that it prevents you from, you know, you get this extra move to speed up the game, but What are these rules of chess I didn't know that are bullshit? Six, the king does not end up in check, which I guess is a rule that for That would be fucking, moves. if you did that, you're fucking stupid. Okay, <laughs> keep going. Seven, the king and the chosen rook are on the same rank. Wait a minute. So you can, what do you mean on the same rank? The row? So you can actually move them both forward and then do it? I don't understand that part, actually. Because then they would have moved, which would have invalidated the first thing, right? I mean, you can only do it in the back row from their starting positions when neither of them have moved, right? So how could they not be on the same rank? I don't know, that actually. Makes, that's, a really, that's a redundant rule. Here's a handbook. A handbook all about just castling and that's it? Here, I will continue to investigate this later because uh, uh, the point I was making wasn't that I'm so smart and everyone else doesn't know chess. Well, you're clearly not that smart if you had to read Wikipedia to <laughs> know I'm this. But I'm saying that you're no smarter than me. Gamer nerds I found don't actually know chess that well, and it's not chess is not popular among gamers. If the and chess, people who like chess do not like other games. It's because there is a chess community, and in fact, the Go community sort of also to some extent doesn't cross over with the rest of the gaming community. It's like the gaming community is super inclusive. We'll have you chess people. We'll have you go people. But they don't want us. They don't want to hang out with us Puerto Rico players and us, you know, power grid players. They just want to stay all by themselves. Like their game is its own thing. And I guess by having their game be its own thing, does it make them feel so, somehow their game is above all other games? So this is a roundabout way of once again recommending Richard Garfield's book because he talks about that and he equates chess to Counter-Strike in this regard. Mm. And he makes some very good points. I as finished to why. chapter one. Ah, I am in chapter two. <laughs> I read the whole section about heuristics just recently. Isn't that the directional heuristics versus positional heuristics? No, just how gamers use heuristics and how nubs can't really figure out any. You and a, you know, in a, especially in a game, no one can fit bad ah, game. <laughs> uh, so these we have terms for this, but basically his terms are a directional heuristic is a. A heuristic you have that tells you or helps you decide what move to make. That's the ones I use most often. And a positional heuristic tells you who's winning. That's the part that everyone who uh, plays games with I use me those as well. fucks up. They think that because they're in the front in Mario Kart that they're somehow in first place. Right. Yeah, the directional heuristic is in power grade when I'm counting how much money I can bid on the power plant. Yeah. How much I have to save for the resources. And meanwhile, the positional heuristic is, well, am I going to be in first or last? And who's actually winning? Watch out for Rim. Watch out for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only one you need. So Doesn't another game what came game out. It is. Uh, many of our friends work from Muse Games, and you know, we talked about this a bit before, but Guns of Icarus Online actually finally came out. The Why Steam so many games come out? Who and, has money or time? And I've been working from home all week because of the hurricane. So I've been playing a bunch of these games. And I got to say, I played Guns of Icarus a bunch during the beta, and it was pretty fun. It's like... To imagine two on two like ships versus, uh, and you're man and guns and run around like each team each ship has a captain and you can target different. But there's parts no of the boarding. Ship. You can't board the other there's, ships. <laughs> wait, I heard there was going to be boarding. No, there's not going to be. In fact, boarding. I heard a I heard a very very credible <laughs> rumor that there will in fact be boarding in Guns of Icarus Online. <laughs> 
I have a reliable source to say. It wouldn't Emily, be that Emily hard. Is, Emily is yelling fuck you from the other room. I don't know why. It wouldn't be that hard to yes, do. Yes, it would. I, mean, think like I know you why. Just, do you know why it's going to be so do, hard? No. Uh, no. No. It's so easy. No, it's not. All you got to do, I mean, how, every FPS in the world, you jump from one platform to another. This ship is a no, platform. No, it's not the game part of it that's the problem. That well, ship is a platform. You jump. No. You just press space bar. He jumps. If there's another ship under your feet when you land, Scott, there you are. Have you ever written anything? Have you ever done anything in Unity? No. So it's highly likely that player entities are tied to ship entities or something like that or to teams. So they're not independent objects that can interact completely independently. It's not just a floating platform. No, because sounds be like somebody didn't think about that in the beginning. Or part, they did. Because I would make late. a secondary argument that from a play perspective, how many games have you played that had a first person perspective in melee combat? Who says it has to be melee combat? All right, so I jump onto the enemy ship, and there's a dude there. Freaking shoot him. Okay. In a world... The so most basic thing in a first-person shooter. You have a gun, and you're pointing at someone, and you go bang. The Except, simplest possible thing. But it's a world where not everybody has these handheld guns. In fact, as far as I can tell, the only guns are giant ship-mounted guns. Uh, maybe they should... It's not that hard to add a handgun to an FPS... That is the the most baby FPS tutorial thing to do. Ah, but it messes up the kind of rhythm of the game. Cause think that about what, is a serious problem. Think right? about what happens. <laughs> that <laughs> is a very serious problem. One guy's on your ship. You're trying to fly it. Meanwhile, he's really good at FPS. No, I'm going to make He goes a... around your ship killing you all the exactly. time. Exactly. Where do you, the... re do you respawn on this flying boat? Do you respawn on a so new boat? So I you... was going Did to Did make... he just steal your boat? Can he pile... Can he use the guns on your boat to shoot at your, you know, in disguise to shoot? at the friendly boat them thinking it's a friend but really it's a, a bad guy got on there and killed everybody from boarding so what this basically comes down to is we did that lecture at then it'll be, there'll be no reason to use the big boats because someone will just steal them with their fps skills and jump off the tiny boat and just board the big boats. so scott maybe you get around that by doing a team fortress 2 thing and gimping the fps part but then it's not nearly as fun yep. at least people like there, us there is a huge Game completely broken flaw if you allow the boarding. So what I'm getting at is that we talked about that concept of like in Mega, fa Mega, Mega Factory, Mega TF or Weapons Factory, how one asshole who's just better at head clicking than everyone else literally can dominate an entire team. Indeed. So uh, you're going to get to a chapter that talks about the same thing. It's like factors of play. So like if I'm playing Puerto Rico... Actually, the, what's the, he used some other game as an example. Hearts was the example. He's like, one. if I use zero factors or zero heuristics, I'm playing randomly. If I use one heuristic, uh, paying attention to how many hearts are in my hand, <laughs> suddenly I have a much higher chance of winning. Really? Say I use another additional heuristic, paying attention to whether or not the Queen of Spades has been played yet. That's another huge advantage for relatively little effort. Mm -hmm. Let's say I now also I use a third one. I also keep track of the king and ace of spades. Not as much of a return, not as common to pay out, but gives me a higher chance of winning, just less of one. Well, I pay attention to them if I fucking have them. Uh, so how to get rid of their asses. So as you keep applying, what if I start counting cards? Like count the number of hearts played by anyone. Count the number of points taken by anyone. Every factor I add, every like thing or skill I use takes additional effort and gives me an additional chance of winning, you know, but there is a diminishing return. Right. What if you're playing hearts and you have the queen, king, and ace of spades all in your hand all at once? Ah, usually if that's the case, it depends. Do so I have any other spades in my hand? Well, I, the only really hope you have is if you can get rid of another suit very quickly and then play no, no, all no, no, three no. of those. See, this is we think we think about hearts on very different levels. I have two questions in that situation. One, do I? Well, three questions. One, do I have any other spades, and if so, how many? Two, is the person I am exchange giving cards to an idiot or not? And three, am I low on a suit that is not spades? Mm. Or hearts? Yeah, if you're low on a suit that's not spades, you can just play, you can just empty your hand of that suit and then hope someone else plays that suit, allowing you to dump all of their... You now, know. I would not do that if I had the queen and a small number of spades, Well, you only really need to dump, not have the ace and the king. You only if you need the, to dump the queen. You can dump the other ones later. No, no, no. The thing is, if I have the queen, having the ace is great and the king is great. Do you know why? Uh, shooting moons? No. I rarely be shoot really, the moon. I'm just saying it'd be really easy to shoot the moon because you know when you play the queen, there's no chance of someone else being forced to take it by you know having the king or ace be the only card eh, remaining in their hand. I would disagree because usually I don't shoot the moon 
that early. By the time it's at the point, like, if someone gives me the queen, it's usually not apparent that I'm shooting the moon yet. It just looks like I'm sucking. Mm. But no, it's because if I have the king and the ace, or at least one of them, and someone else is trying to force me to queen myself by playing low spades... I can take the trick with the ace or king, maybe take a heart if I'm forced to, and then switch lead, it up to something yeah, else. Yeah, lead with yeah. something else and delay the inevitable fucking that I'm about to get. <laughs> but you're only delaying the inevitable. You're going to get 13 points. Well, this comes down to an interesting quirk of game theory. Among a, re- a wide spread of players, stuff like that works really well. If I just play perfectly, optimally, and conservatively, there's a chance other people will fuck up, and I'm very likely to win. I always play hearts 100% conservative. If. Four skilled players play hearts conservatively. It's random. So instead, you can only augment your chance of winning by playing aggressively. Yeah. Anyway, my, the original point with the boarding was simply that this is another case of the Counter-Strike. Everyone says remove the AWP. Yep. Every, everyone says add boarding. Don't do it. You'll mess the game up like tribes do. Yo, dogs. Game mm. design. Wah. Complicated deaths. That's right. <laughs> But anyway, things of the day. So uh, in gaming, as you all know, especially people who've played games with me before, I'm a huge fan of the trash talking. No. I mean, back at RIT, we used to always do the uh, trash talk Mario Tennis tournament where you were obligated to trash talk the other team while you played. Mm -hmm. And you were graded on your trash talking independently of the tennis match. It's one that is the best trash talk. Now, trash talking is also a difficult (laughs) subject. Because, for example, that is the boo noise. Some people enjoy trash talk. The and noise some people of victory. Don't. But if there is someone who can't deal with trash talk in your group, and they want to play a game, if you trash talk, don't be them, friends with them. You make them feel bad. Don't be friends with them. If Just you don't never, never trash speak to talk them, again. them, you make them feel equally bad. <laughs> but anyway, this is a video of. What can happen? You see, there are two important kinds of trash talk. Backed up and not backed up. Uh, or pre-hock and post-hock. Those are the same kind. I am a fan of the post-hock trash talk. That is Rim's specialty. I will be very quiet during the game until my victory is assured. And the more likely it is that I'm going to win, the more I ramp it the fuck up. See, I'm of the pre-hock nature, right? And that is the pre-hock. See, I view post-hock trash talk as sort of invalid trash talk. It's like you've already won and now you're talking shit. Ooh, you're so brave to talk shit after you've... It's like... Yeah, you, I'm that's brave. Like you I beat your gu- ass. And you beat a guy up, he's bleeding on the floor, and then you start talking shit. What? It's like, what, what? kind of what? what kind of pussy are you, right? A real man, someone who is, you know, and I don't mean the gender man, I just mean someone who is who is brave and, and you know, awesome at, at gaming, will trash talk and hype themselves up before... The challenge. That is to say, I'm about to kick your ass. Yeah, I can take you. See, Bring now here's it. the problem. You use the pre hoc too much. So when you, because if so, if you sometimes trash talk before I go you in, win, sometimes I go in with the pre hoc and say, Bring it. And then they bring it and I get my ass kicked. See, if, if I trash talk after the fact and I lost, well, that just means I'm stupid. But if I trash talk before and I lose, I have lost doubly, which is why my pre hoc trash talk is very rare. But when I bring it, Usually all I do is I just do the Babe Ruth point right before the game. <laughs> See, but the thing is, I win more often than not. So pre- <laughs> Except that's not true. So pre hoc talking, <laughs> like the pre hoc talking I just did one sentence ago. I will beat I'm I'm Babe Ruthing. <laughs> I will beat you in the next competitive ortho game that you and I play together. Whoever's name is Scott wins. I didn't agree to play that game. <laughs> Doesn't matter, I won. I will win the next ortho game that you and I play. <laughs> Sure. Uh, Did you get to the part of the book where he says what an ortho game is? No. Okay. It's read chapter one, I told you. I forget where that is. It was a while ago when I read it. So, so this how is does a video. this trash talk discussion relate to a this thing of the day? This is a video from a fight, as in people punching each other. And it one which, dude. Which fighting sport is it? Is it boxing? Is it uh, pancreas? Is it, what is it? It's boxing-esque. Okay. But basically, one dude is way cocky, and the other guy punches him a whole bunch. And he basically just doesn't even defend himself and walks over like, what, 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 bring it, bring it. And the other guy brings it. And that's the end. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful thing to behold. And it has the tags, ouch, fail, fights, fighting, and cocky. Okay. So check this out. There's a game coming out called Apotheon or Apotheon or whatever. And this game, from all intents and purposes in the video that you look at here, seems to be a completely average 
platforming combat-ish kind of game where you jump and throw spears and block things with your shield and that sort of thing. Not too uh, much excitingness going on here. 2D platformer. It seems like it's going to be on Steam on Windows and then maybe other platforms later. Whatever. But the stylings, the visual uh, aesthetic stylings of this game are looking like one of my favorite stylings. The ancient Greek stylings that you Scott see loves on... nothing more than depictions of old Greek men. There are things I love more, but I love this a lot. So it looks like you know your dude has like the shield with the snake on it, the big circle shield. He throws a spear. Everything's orange and black and white, and you have those little sort of square spiral things going all on the borders of the terrain. And you fight like you know it's pretty much like you're looking in the in the Greek history section of the museum. Uh, and it's come to life, and that's the video game. So this video is pretty much all you need from this game, since it looks to be a pretty boring game. You don't need to actually play. Maybe it'll be really cheap on Steam one day. Um, but the because the looking pretty tight if you like that sort of game. Yeah. Well, yeah, but because the styling is so good, the video promoting the game is thing of the day worthy, and hence it is my thing of the day. It looks exactly like the art on the sides of Amphora. Yes, my favorite kind. You mean carrots? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if anyone will get that. Nobody will get that. So, in the meta moment, the book club book is still The Name of the Wind by... Patrick Rothfuss. I'm most of the way through it. It's pretty good, but the only complaint I have is that it was just rocking through scenes and, and drama and everything. Really great. I have one, one kind of complicated complaint that I'm going to save for the book club show. But he's been in the school for a long time. School, and the school sc isn't short. How long were you in school? But the school How boy long drama. How in school? The schoolboy drama is just the same bullshit. The jackass guy keeps being a jackass. All right. How long were you in school for? All told, well, what the wizard school? Five years. Right. So, how many years has he been in the wizard school? Do I don't need every detail. How it, how how many years have you been reading this book? I'm just saying. <laughs> That's right. I don't a think, lot less than it takes. To I don't think it. most of what happened to him in school is all that important. Well, finish the book and then we'll do an episode and we can discuss this again. I mean, I get it. He's the Kellis Mary Sue golden child of the world. The smartest, That's the best per That's person That's ever the born. But isn't that the book I always say I want to read? <laughs> yeah, well, now you get it. Because we always end up reading a book about like, you know, freaking who? Uh, Kellis? Kind of, right? But how come we don't get to read a book about Seswatha? We're going to get to, I think. Or Kelmomus. In fact, I think things are repeating. You're going to get the same story told again. Maybe. That book's coming out soon. Yeah, and how come, you know, we get this story about like, oh, Sauron, right? But if you want the real story, you got to read The Silmarillion, which Silmarillion is not... Silmarillion is boring as fuck. That's I'm only sorry. because it was a mishmash of a whole bunch of shit. We could have gotten the real story of, you know, the nine kings and whatnot. Right, but no, yeah, we didn't get that. Thing is, that plays out like a instead we get that a story. plays out like the same Burning Wheel game you play, except everyone's white shade Inst instead of black right, shade. And still, instead, we get a story about like, yeah, those kings. Yeah, well, here's some statues of them. It's like, no, tell me the story about the king who was so awesome that they made a giant statue of him pointing. King right? Awesome, that's who I want to hear about. I don't want to hear about some fucking hobbits. King right? Awesome did a W seven wound to the beast as opposed to a B seven wound. I love that shit. <laughs> Hook me up. Where who? Tell me, anyone who reads a lot of fantasy novels, Alex, where is the st where is the fantasy novel that is about the great? I guess Earthsea is about the great wizard, right? Uh, of all times. No. Yeah. But even in Earthsea, there was a past, you know, time that is alluded to where dragons were all over the fuck, right? Where is the story about the time when dragons were just all over the fuck? Hopefully, and, we'll get a flashback to Star Swirl the and bearded. like there, yeah, and there weren't any amazing castles yet because guess what? The great king built the fucking castle, right? You're going to be real disappointed when that king built the castle upon the ruins of the even greater, older castle. No, I want to hear the story of the greatest, oldest castle. Yeah, Scott, you know what? It's castles all the way down. It's not castles all the way down. <laughs> there is a pre-castle era. Are you giving me some pre-castle trash talk? In which case, it was not a castle, but a hut. You're going pre-castle? No, this kid. Or a, you know, a mead hall. <laughs> so uh Magfest, we're going. That's we're gonna a, be that's a while from now. We're probably gonna be doing a revamped version of Losing Should Be Fun, and we will probably be on one or two of the gaming intellectuals things. We're still working out the details. Uh I guess Anime Boston. 
Whoa, future. Yeah, Kineticon. PAX East, PAX Aus. Oh, yeah, and PAX Aus is sold out of three-day badges, so if you didn't buy them... That's a shame. You've learned your lesson now, I hope, about not buying a PAX badge the day it goes on sale. That's a shame. We'll probably be there unless something bad happens. Wait, and I very, put it, very likely to be there. And I want to put it on the record that we have suggested perhaps the best possible names for the theaters that they could have down there. <laughs> I think they should just take the names of the theaters from regular packs, append them with Apparently, the word Apparently, I, he I heard from a very extremely reliable source there will only be three theaters at PAX Off. I had a list that said there will be a total of 80 panels? Possibly. That sounds about right, based on, you know, we had 300 Kineticon across 11 rooms. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, all right, let's. Uh, Smaller oh, rooms. I think we had enough meta here. Right? Okay, okay. You, uh, let's move on to our show show. So, before we do the show show, so, you know, Burning so Con. Show 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 show. Burning Con's pretty great, but I would like to point out that a long time ago we may or may not have told this anecdote, but it is very relevant to what we're about to do, so I feel like it must be repeated. Repeating the anecdote. We knew a guy. Let it be written. We knew a guy at RIT. Do you, remember, gonna, do you remember his name? Yes, I remember his first and last name, and I remember the last time I saw him. Which are was, his initials A.W.? Uh, they are indeed. And when was the last time you saw him? When he was working at Pita Pit. Uh, we have seen him at the same time yes. as the last time. So, uh, he's a dude. I won't get into anything else about him, because it's not really about him. It's about it all of us, It is not about really. him at all. This is a story for all men of all times. We would, do you want to tell the story entirely on your own, or shall we share in the telling? So, uh, I'll just get right to the point. One day, dude comes up to me. Very early. We only met this guy a few times at this point. And we were talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Who doesn't Scott. at nerd school? Yeah, because we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Who doesn't it, at nerd school? With damn it, Dwayne, which I think is his legal name. So, Maybe uh, it is now. We're playing D&D, &D, talking about D&D. &D, we're actually at Anime Club talking about D&D. &D. So the AW comes over and he's like, ah, I play D&D &D as well. Ah, don't now, we all? It's nerd school. Now, we were talking about when we were going to play the next game or some, some like meta detail. He goes right in with, let me tell you about my character. He's let a 17th level you. barbarian named Thag. It's funny because it sounds like Fag. All righty. This went on. Oh, did this go on? It went on far too long. I don't know why other people stood standing there. I sort of meandered and slinked away. The yeah, and steps. I think at that point I drew aggro, but so I couldn't because really get away. he was loud, I still heard most of the details. -ish. So I got to hear all about. I've forgotten as many as I could. There was something about the weapon he uses was particularly gay. So I got to hear all about Thag and his somewhat, uh, I don't know, bigoted adventures through <laughs> the Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Extremely worlds. bigoted adventures. I would also like to point out, uh, perhaps this is relevant. Perhaps it is not. A.W. may be the biggest Sailor Moon fan I've ever known. Uh, no. No? Hoagie Steve. Was he, he really liked it more? Yeah, I think he liked it more. I don't know. He was also a stand-up dude. Well, yeah. Oh, nothing wrong with Hoagie Steve. I will stand by Hoagie Steve uh, Hoagie and Steve, his legacy. Hoagie Steve is totally awesome. Much more awesome than A.W. with his bigoted D&D &D characters. If any of you who are there <laughs> are listening and feel bad, don't feel bad. Uh, no. So, the moral here is simple. Nobody wants to hear about your D&D &D character. That's right. Even if you both play Dungeons & Dragons, even if Dungeons & Dragons is the only thing either of you care about, if you are not in the campaign together, no one cares. Right now, there are things that you can discuss about D&D &D with other people, or any RPG. You can discuss, you know, uh, general ideas, you know, the mechanics, rules, you know, you can even tell interesting stories. Don't tell about the character, but you can tell the story. For example, here is a story example, the one I like to tell so often from summer camp. You know, the GM had created, you know, by hand this big ass dungeon with an evil wizard in it on the top in a castle on top of a cliff like Castlevania and shit. Notice and God has not told me the name or level of a character so far. No, I have not. We were all to be fun and because we were middle school kids, really high power level guys, right? One of our players was a druid. He cast summon big ass monster he could, and he selected from the monstrous manual of second edition the earthworm, which proceeded to eat the ground from under the castle and it fell into the sea, thus uh, making it completely unnecessary to go through the dungeon, meet the evil wizard, or anything of the such. 
the GM probably should have captured someone to be in distress that we had to rescue from the castle, so that wouldn't have happened, or not put the castle on a cliff. Uh, and that is a funny story of d Lessons were learned all around. Right. Now, allow me to tell a story, and I'm going to tell it in the incorrect way. Uh-oh. So um, I was playing Elaith Radira. He was a 16th level blade singer. This is all true, he could you do- people. <laughs> just want to let everyone know. <laughs> I can verify true. for 100% that everything he's telling you in this story is true in that Rim did play this character. Now, I converted him from 2nd Ed to 3rd Ed, and he got a lot less powerful in 3rd Ed because the way they changed the rules. But in 2nd Ed, he had up to 4 or 5 attacks per round, depending on the... No one cares. You're not going to keep going? No, I'm not going to keep going. But don't really... you really? But see, I just want to verify one thing. While we agreed, no one wants to hear that and no one cares. Do you or do you not enjoy telling those things? It feels real good. There you go. And this is why people do not learn this lesson. Because everyone loves to tell you about their character. No one likes listening to anyone else so, here talk about their character. It is possible to talk about your characters. If you tell what is actually an amusing anecdote, so mechanical details, like if I'm telling Luke Crane, the creator of Burning Wheel, about something crazy that happened in my game, if I say, like, OBS 10, 8 dice, success, the mechanical details actually will be relevant and interesting to him in the context of the story. For most other people in the world, that is not true. Mm -hmm. If you cannot gauge whether or not your audience cares about what level your barbarian was, You should probably leave that detail out and get to the meaty part, like when he killed the dude. So, with that being said, we both went to Burning Con, where we did nothing but play our tabletop RPGs for a weekend. Let us tell you about the (laughs) games we played. When there is one great exception to this rule, and that is, you can say whatever you want if you have a podcast. Ah. And there's another great exception to this rule. If you don't like listening to us talk about it, just turn this podcast the fuck off. In fact, why are you even <laughs> listening to this podcast? What is wrong with you? Don't you have something better to do? All right. So, uh, Burning Con uh, is the third Burning Con. It was the Triad Umbrit featuring the games of Luke Crane, uh, Vince Baker. Baker, and John Harper. Yes. Yes. Uh, so... Uh, of course, when you go to Burning Con, you must run a session, and there are a total of five sessions. Despite hurricanes, all of the sessions happened, and I played in four sessions and ran the final session. I did the same, and it was well, actually Well, you ran the great. first session and played four sessions after. But I played the same number of games. I had That's the same great. basic experience in a slightly different order. So let us briefly discuss the sessions which we have played. Uh, Let's start with the one that we both did, because that actually was pretty great. Okay, so this is run by our friend Matt from Nerd NYC. Uh, and it's kind of funny because I knew Matt. I saw that he was there. Uh, I knew him from Nerd NYC. He's an acquaintance. He's a, yep. good, he's a good guy. He had played in my game just right. before. And I was looking at the schedule, and it saw, and I saw this Burning Wheel game about dwarves. And I said, I'll play in a Burning Wheel game about dwarves. Who's Matt something? Because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know his last name. I go over to the table, and I see Matt sitting there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. It's the same guy. This is what I get for not learning le- people's last names. But then knowing him, I'm like, I know he plays the RPGs, but I've never RPG'd with Matt. I wonder if he is any good. And in fact, he was very good. Well, I think the and reason his game he was good was very nice. Is what I I'm glad one of the most important things about Burning Con is that they had a very strict rule about no hacks. No bullshit. I changed the rules at Burning Wheel because I'm well, smart. Well, they than do. The guy they have hacks. It. it just says parentheses hack. So not and a lot know. of games said parentheses hack. So what to to be a- allowed to run a hack of one of the games, Mm -hmm. you had to submit all the weird rules and everything possible about your quote hack to the people running the convention for review, and they had full veto power. All right. If you did not do this, they it is uh, a offered dire consequences. Burning Con is a curated convention. They the the three you know the triad umbrit will decide which games will be run when. So uh, we played in Matt's game, which was not a hack at all. It was Burning Wheel with and dwarves. The stre- Burning Wheel is pretty damn good. The strength of Burning Wheel, the best convention scenarios, are the very straightforward ones, usually involving dwarves. That's why I I. I I played in five great games, and I blame that on always choosing the straightforward Burning Wheel game most of the time. So uh, his game was pretty much about these dwarves, and the deal was is there were two dwarven castles. And two complete asshole dwarven princes. Right, two dwarven princes. One dwarven, Both assholes, that's very important. One dwarven prince had been there for a long time. The other one had only appeared recently, and they were both competing to dig up 
precious things from the same mountain range in different mountains. It was versus Dwarf Fortress. Yes, to see, you know, which one their father would approve of more than the other. Now, when we were selecting characters, I actually did something that I usually do not do. Usually... I choose, Rim can tell what kind of character I would choose. Scott usually wants to choose either the guy who's not related to the game at all. No, that's a good one. Or he wants to choose like, usually like the standoffish thief or the guy who's like the super powerful in his particular little realm, like support character. Yes, I like to. Merchant. Right. You know, something like that. I want to choose, like when he played Inheritance, who did I choose? The dwarven mystical guy with the magic runes. Yeah, magic runes. Right? The off to the side guy. But this time I said, you know what? I'm going to choose the number one guy. Give me the dwarven prince. I demanded it. So the and I received prince it. was not an asshole when the character sheet was handed to Scott. Yes, it was. <laughs> well, yes. The yes, moment it you was. touched it, he became perhaps the second greatest asshole in that game. There's nothing on that character sheet. That said nice guy on it. it there was said, nothing on it. Did you have the trait asshole? It was it. They had the trait of greedy. I also had the trait of greedy. Okay. I had not only the trait, but also the the emotional attribute of greed. Okay. <laughs> right? Uh, all my beliefs were all about digging up as much shit as possible. So out this of broke that down mountain. pretty well. I was Scotty. I was like the super engineer. Like I managed all the mining oh, and all the bullshit. That is what you were, yeah. Yeah. So I kind of played that kind of guy, which I usually actually like playing a guy like that. But it was a kind of an aside because usually I play the big bad like leader type. Mm. So Scott played the asshole and I played the engineer. And of course, bullshit goes down in the mine. A bunch of dwarves disappear. Well, there were two other players. Oh yeah, they were playing whatever. <laughs> playing whatever. Actually, they were really good. Yeah, one of them was the. Uh, I'm trying to remember what their dwarves did. It was only a few days ago, Scott. I know. Really? Really? Uh, really? Uh, really? Uh, really? So we had the advisor, the oh, smart no, guy. No, the advisor was the um was an NPC. The Seneschal. Yeah, well, basically, one of the characters ended up effectively being the advisor to Scott. <laughs> okay. And uh, the, the story is pretty simple. The mine, some bullshit happens, a bunch of dwarves disappear, so he goes to investigate. And it turns out there's a huge spider army and a spider princess. Nobody would roll seduction. I was actually really pissed off about that. Uh-huh. He should have. And we wanted to wait. Well, no, Scott wanted to kill all the spiders. I didn't want to kill all the spiders. I wanted to safely extract all of the riches from the mountain, which would not have been possible with a spider presence. Yeah, so he basically wants to get the spiders out of the way and get all these gems and rubies and whatever. Yeah. Uh, the other dude wants to negotiate with the spiders because they actually seem pretty chill. I was willing to allow negotiations to occur... But I did not have faith that they would be successful. It took a deeds point in a duel of wits to convince you to let us do this. Yeah. This is very important because, you see, when everything fell apart and the shit hit the fan, all Scott did was turn to the character who made this happen and say, this is your deeds point. You wanted this. This is what you wanted. That's right. (laughs) So (laughs) the spiders wanted a a sacrifice of a dwarven prince because we owed them some debt. So, of course, immediately all us underling dwarves are like, Scott's really an asshole. Let's just sacrifice him to these spiders and then make an alliance with them. Of course. So Scott tries to instead sacrifice his worthless brother. Why not? I was perfectly willing to help. And when I asked you to just fund me for the ability to do it. Wait, you you asked for unlimited funds. Dwarf. You were traitorous. You were willing to turn against... You know, and throw away your dwarven loyalty and your dwarven oath in or in or, for money. Turn against. You are asking me to turn those ballista around at the true prince of the land. No, to I just, sacrifice him to a I, spider. No, I want. Yeah, when I was perfectly willing to sacrifice you instead. Right, and that is why. I tried to slay thee I was, for your disloyalty you and dishonor. Me, like a gold piece, I would have been like, "Okay, let's do this." You said unlimited funds. If you had asked for like, you know, ten gold or something, we could have maybe gotten to negotiations. But you could have haggled since me since down. your demand was so extreme. I offered a suggestion that was like walking into a you know discussion with a crazy creationist person. I offered so I you wasn't gold. Even gonna, you weren't. And- 
golden gems and your counter offer was cold hard axe to my neck. And did that axe strike true? No, because you suck at axes and I ran into the castle and barricaded against you and proceeded to try to murder you and everyone around you. And who <laughs> turned out the winner at the end of the day? So basically, fuck you. That's right. And yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> wasn't so bad because one, you see, here's how much an asshole Scott is. So he tries to kill or steal his worthless brother and sell him to spiders anyway. He fails at it due to incompetence. Let's he comes back. Dice. I failed at it due to dice. So meanwhile, these two dwarven princes are fighting. The rest of us go to the spiders. We're like, tell you what, daddy, two dwarven princes. <laughs> That's what you did. And didn't go so well because Scott sucks and stuff went wrong. <laughs> I got the dice turned to my favor is why. So finally, basically, he murders me, imprisons my wife, murders in cold blood the spider princess and both of her innocent retainers. Innocent spiders trying to eat me. Yeah, yeah based on a, a deal your granddaddy made with the spiders. Yeah, nothing to do with me. Yeah, yeah. dwarven blood and all. Right. So... He does that, and thus he has no real army or way to defend the fortress. And then the spiders come in the night. I just move into my everyone. dead brother's fortress, <laughs> which is a castle and not just a fort. The Denimont was kind of sad. I think you guys survived, but it wasn't great. Yeah, I survived. I, was... I just I take issue with your uh, tactical decision to murder the head of both your artillery and your mining operations the mere hours before the spiders were going to invade. You were just upset because that was you. <laughs> if it was not you that was being murdered, you probably wouldn't have felt bad about it at all. It was a pretty great For game. example, if uh, the Seneschal had been a player character and that was you and the engineer was an NPC and I wanted to kill the engineer, you would not have given two shits. I like how the Seneschal was like... You would have given like, no fucks. I'm a reasonable man. Well, the Seneschal was the greatest because I had this, I had this what, instinct. Like, he betrayed I, whoever. There's an NPC, the Seneschal, who was like the old wise dwarf to ask for advice. I had an instinct to always ask him for advice, so I always did. And he and then Matt he always, always gave good advice. Matt always came in like, oh, I'm <laughs> the old dwarf and you should do this. When you were like, and I, I wanna... said, and whenever he said I did, I was like, yes, I'll do that. You were like, I'm gonna betray my brother and feed him to the spiders. And the seneschal was like, that seems like the most wise course of action. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in fact, you can blame some of my jerky actions on the advice of the GM who told me exactly <laughs> what to do. So that was a good game. <laughs> it was a great game. I got to tell you, if you ever need to run a short, like four hour one off burning wheel game, you cannot go wrong with just burning up four dwarves and giving them beliefs. All right. Let's, what other games have we played? I played in this game. Uh, the first game I played in was with Rachel. Hey, Rachel. Are you listening? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Rachel's totally awesome. Uh, Rachel is pretty badass. I played in several games with her. Yeah, her game was like, the, you know, I had first priority in that slot and I'm thankful because that is the game people were piling on because people know. And Rachel, she, like, you know, I prepared by burning up characters. Rachel fucking prepares, right? She had little stand-ups with little faces and little name thingies that little, you know, tents for each character. And she had, like, little, she had a little stack of uh, paper with a bunch of, like, people's uh, photographs printed on them. And whenever a new character, NPC, came into the game, she'd write their name on the paper and lay it on the table so that you could remember all the different characters that were going around. And, oh, man, she, she's got the shit going on. Actually, you know what I did in my game that I'm going to do? from now on forever mm -hmm. i brought uh sticky name tags yep. that i wrote the names of the characters on yep. i didn't put them on the people because that doesn't work i taped into the table in front of each player yeah she did the same thing with the tents with the pictures though yeah the pictures. So, yeah, are good. she really prepared so i didn't have pictures the game we played she called it uh the wreck and basically the idea was it was a prison ship and it was going to a prison colony and we were all thieves that had been caught right and we were in the prison ship but then the ship crashes on the shore. It's on the same island as the colony, but it's not at the colony. It's like around the other side of the island. Oh, shit. So, of course, we're mostly free except for some shackles. Most of everyone else is dead except for the PCs, a couple NPCs, and, like, the captain. And then shit goes down. And uh, shit went down pretty well. And it, it was sort of weird. It's like I'm playing, and I sort of felt like I was coasting along, you know, getting fair amount of spotlight time, right? You know, I was feeling good about what I was doing, but I really felt, you know, you know, I wasn't the main person. I was, I was sort of, you know, maybe secondary, right? But the plot got in a really good way. You know, we managed to uh, get some disguises and, and get, you know, trick people into thinking that we weren't prisoners and then going into town and taking care of all the NPCs who might have wanted to send us to the prison colony and sort of set up a new life of, 
you know, uh, thievery <laughs> and thieves guildishness on this island that was sort of a brand new colony, uh, you know, and, and things actually turned out pretty well for us. But, you know, there were not uh, a lack of conflicts along the way, meeting strangers in the woods. Whoa, wait, whoa, wait a minute. Conflicts in a burning wheel game. No. You know, it was, it was uh, overall a most excellent game. It didn't really have any of those uh, too many killer, crazy, exciting moments like trying to kill Rim. Yeah. But great moments nonetheless, like... Uh, Tricking the guy in the woods into thinking that one of us was the captain and just stabbing the captain in the fucking neck. Shit like that. You know, good stuff. So uh, the first game I played after the dwarf game was a peak role-playing experience for me. It was actually one of the greatest role-playing experiences I've ever had in my life. Oh, my God. So the first actual burning wheel I ever played you know, when the scary Luke Crane that wasn't motherfucker... Ju- that wasn't just a demo. Yeah, so this Luke Crane motherfucker tricked me into playing this demo, and then he tricked me into playing this other demo, and then it was on. Yeah. But uh, the first real Burning Wheel game I played was that Ubercon. Uh, Scott was there. Wasn't there an episode about this? There might be, but it was Inheritance. It was a LARPish Burning Wheel scenario for a whole shit ton of people. It's about a Viking funeral. So... He's been keeping this in his head and mulling it over for a long time, and he ran it, and he's run it several times in this format... He ran it at Burning Con for nine people as a straight LARP, no dice. Mm-hmm. And he changed himself. He got rid of the dwarf and his magic runes. No, that's the most important guy. Not really. No, he. Mer- I think actually merging, I mean, I love the dwarven runes guy, but merging the role of the dwarven runes guy with the Christian priest guy really streamlines it. That is an excellent move. So you could tell this was big because despite having nine player slots and being the last slot on Saturday... I was the only number two priority person in the game, and everyone else was priority one. Mm-hmm. And I only got my slot because I got there first, and because I had the GoPro, so I think they kind of wanted that to get set up. My GoPro you got in with? Yeah, I think so. Got in with my camera, huh? So what if I shouldn't have brought it? So here's the deal. I had mine with me, too. I just didn't set it up. Mm. So here's the deal with this game. He he talked a bit about, you know, we talked a bit about those sort of hardcore Danish role-playing games, and the room had a big table in it in these areas, and he used these very interesting rules. The only rules were body language and envelopes we weren't allowed to open. Mm -hmm. So the way it worked was you just walked around. You're in the big house. And, you know, like a Viking house and I think the year 1100 or something. And if you are in a conversation, you have to stand like in the circle of the conversation with your name tag visible. If you are eavesdropping on a conversation, you stand a, a little bit back and you hold your hand over your name tag. No one can engage you, but you cannot interact with the scene at all. Oh, but eavesdrop! But you can always enter the scene by taking your hand off the no. Name. No, if you are eavesdropping, you cannot enter as your next scene, the scene on which you are eavesdropping. Oh, which is actually I don't want to get into all the details of why, but watching it play out is a brilliant rule that this would this game would not work without that rule. That is a clever rule. So the other rule is if you are in a scene, and it is a confrontational or adversarial thing. You stand shoulder to shoulder, angled slightly inward with the people you are allied with, sort of encircling the person you are against. So anyone looking at the scene, just glancing even, can see very obviously... Even if they're in another scene and not eavesdropping, they can still see the other scenes and how they are constructed. They can see who is outnumbered or like who's confronting whom. Mm. Even more importantly, all information learned while eavesdropping officially can be used openly. Your character knows it. Mm. So there are three areas. But no one can catch you eavesdropping or prevent you from eavesdropping. And there are three areas outside the house, in the private rooms of the house, and in the great hall in the middle. So if you're in the great hall, everyone in the great hall is all together all the time. Mm. You can walk around the great hall and kind of interact. And it's the, the story of the prodigal son returning. The Viking grandfather has died. They're burning his body in the traditional way. All the sons have returned. Which one will inherit, you know, inheritance? Which one will inherit? The, so the two the families thing? are there. The one son is a worthless, coward, baby loser. One's the badass, awesome, real Viking guy, right? Uh, so the other son... And one's the Christian guy. No, no, no. So the other... No, you don't remember they, this at they all. They changed it. No. no, you just don't remember it. All right. So the other son actually wasn't there because he was exiled for murdering his fucking brother. Mm-hmm. He was exiled by the father himself from the family. So the exiled son returns on the night of the grandfather's funeral to claim his inheritance. I played the former Varangian guard 
strong man who shows up with him to make sure the family doesn't just oh, murder the, him outright. The bodyguard. I played the bodyguard. Mm. I'm going to skip when the details. When we played Inheritance in the Burning Wheel fashion many years ago, the bodyguard was actually one of the more not exciting characters. Yes, yeah, so uh, he was updated a little bit. And his, like, his only purpose was a mechanical purpose, which was to prevent the you know prodigal son from being immediately killed. I don't killed. know what the character sheet said when the person played the thug before, because he was still a thug. He is a consummate badass in every But now he has way. a purpose of his own in, in addition to just pr- protecting the prince from death. Uh, sort of. I, I kind of, I don't know what the, he might have had that in the game we played and the guy just didn't really play it up. Mm. But basically, I was worldly, I'd been around, I'm a badass. And I wanted to marry a girl who my friend wanted to marry. And simultaneously, I wanted my friend, you know, the exiled prodigal son, to claim the inheritance because he's my friend and I'll also be rich. Mm. So I'm going to skip a whole bunch of details of what happened. And I can safely say that I won this game. It ended with everyone dead. I like how we always say you can't win RPGs. No, you can't. No winning and losing. But everyone came but up we- to me and they were like, wow, you won. <laughs> and I won in a game where there's no Did you dice get the rolled. inheritance? Yes, I got the inheritance from both families, and I got to marry the girl. I had an army. I had everything. Well, I, was, I mean, there's no winning in RPGs, but if that's true, that's about as close to winning as you can get. I had everything. If it was the game we played before, it meant I had all the gold, everything in the will. I married the girl. Every enemy was dead. Mm-hmm. And the priest. <laughs> now, the best part of this is I didn't kill anyone. They all killed each other. All I did was stand. There's this moment. The whole time, Luke Crane keeps coming up to me and whispering in my ear. He's like, Rim, you've got to make your move. You're going to lose it. You're not, you're not being active enough. You're, you're going to lose it. Come on, be, you know, do something. And I'm like, no, no, I got this. Shut up. And yeah, I had that. I basically just told everyone, yeah, you talk to him. You hate him. You kill him. And I don't know. It's just because most of the people in this game don't know me that well. Everyone took my advice. <laughs> everyone did exactly what I told them to do. Good job. And it came to this climactic moment where I whip out a sword and go to betray the guy I'm with. If I kill him, I'm not going to get the inheritance. Like, I basically would fuck everything up. I put a sword to his throat, and I threatened his life in front of his dad. And I waited. I was totally bluffing. You know what happened? Everybody fucking stabbed each other all at once, and I was standing there alone and alive. Mm -hmm. So when you watch the time lapse, you're going to see, like, 20 or 30 frames of everyone sitting around a table while the will is being read. One frame of everyone standing up suddenly with all the chairs like thrown to the ground. One with everyone standing with swords through each other's throats. And then one with everyone dead but me. And I'm standing there going, why did you do this, you stupid people? <laughs> it was the greatest experience Maybe when of my you, life. You have to put together the time lapse such that, you know, some frames last longer than others. It is, it is brilliant. And if you ever get a chance to play Luke Crane's Inheritance LARP, it will be a peak role-playing experience for you. However... It is brutal to play. You've got to be 100% without exception in character for a full two and a half to three hours in a room with eight other people who are also Mm -hmm. role-playing in the same capacity. Mm -hmm. There is no break, there is no delay, and there are only three scenes. Mm -hmm. It was was exhausting. (laughs) So while you were playing in that game, I was playing in a game of Dungeoneers and... Oh, right! You hadn't what, played no, that before! No. So if you don't know, this game is a somewhat maybe going to be official something modification of Mouse Guard. Yeah, when I played it last time, they basically were like, yeah, don't really talk about it and don't record anything. No one said anything to me. Yeah, so go nuts. So if they, you know, that's not my problem. Uh, so basically what it is, and it was on the schedule, just so people know the game exists, I don't care. So it's basically, it's a modified Mouse Guard that is... Basically, just for straight up dungeon crawling in the old school D and D way, but it is rough. It is like wow, you are struggling the whole time because it's mouse guard. You're struggling to get checks. You're struggling to succeed at fucking anything. But you're struggling not to just get killed. You're struggling when you finally get the loot to fit it in your goddamn backpack. Yeah, anything you do, you know, gives you you know uh, statuses like you know, oh, I'm now I'm angry. No, now I'm exhausted. Oh, and I'm sick. And I'm uh, and it just brings you down so hard. And you need to earn checks to get it to get it back but you can't earn checks that easily and then you know we had really bad stuff happen like i think at one point like everyone was got like tired it simultaneously it was like uh oh no everyone got hungry uh simultaneously so scott with three exceptions 
all games in the schedule had a number of players. Four players, five players, nine players. One Mouse Guard game had, had Guard Mice instead of players. Mm-hmm. One game had Brave Souls yep. instead of players. And the Dungeoneers and uh, Dragon Slayers that you played had five greedy fools. That is what it had, indeed. <laughs> uh, so the five greedy fools went into this dungeon and tried to get as much loot as possible and get out. A little bit less role-playing, a little bit more dungeoning going on here. Um but really, this game was just, I mean, if you think, you know, I've complained about brutal games like, say, FTL or Ninja Gaiden, <laughs> right? This was brutal. Not only do you struggle not to die, str- but the inventory Tetris is worse than any inventory Tetris I've ever played. We even had a bag of holding, and it's effectively a bag of holding, and it still fucking sucked. We could not fit the shit. We had to dump the coins out of the bag of holding to put other shit in there. And then we basically just like left a pile of coins there. And then like I had a two-handed sack, but to use the two-handed sack, I had to the large sack, I mean. I had to carry it. <laughs> I had to carry the large sack in both hands. I had a two-handed sword. Thank you, character maker, right? Which means I and I had a small you sack. You realize he was cackling while he made those characters. I had to drop every time I need to stab something, I had to put the two hand the sack on j- 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 drop this sack that was in my other hand to hold the sword with two hands and after the fight pick the sack up again but to use the large sack i had to throw away the small sack and the sword (laughs) because there's nowhere to put them in the inventory slots because of how many slots they take up inventory tetris is one of those weird mechanics that for whatever reason just gets me going yeah and it's like we go in we got all these treasures we carry them we figure out how to between us carry them all and then we had to leave and we had to leave a bunch of stuff behind and it's like, you know, you play Oregon Trail and you kill all the buffalo. And then it says, sorry, dude, you only get to carry back 200 pounds of meat. This was like, yo, dude, you killed 2,000 pounds of meat. You get to carry back five of those pounds. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, you want to freaking kill some. Oh. <laughs> oh, and you're tired now because you spent the day shooting. Oh, yeah. By the way, minus 2D <laughs> to all rolls. And if you want to get some of those rolls back... You could drink some wine so Scott, or eat some food, wrong. but guess what? If you eat the drink the wine, it only empties your wine skin, and it's not like you can put coins in there, so, so it doesn't help you to clear out the inventory. So correct me if I'm wrong, but when I played this last time, in Mouse Guard, you get one free check, and you only have to earn extras. When I played this, you didn't get any free checks. It is true that in Mouse Guard, everybody gets a free check every time it is the player's turn. In Dungeoneers and whatever, right, uh, you get no checks at all. You need to earn every check that you use, but you can share checks. So when I had two checks, I gave checks to some other people who really needed them when I did not need them, and vice versa. So uh, so I should clarify one thing on the LARP. I said I didn't kill anyone, so it's kind of an inside joke, and almost no one will get it because the people are there. So Vincent Baker himself played the priest. And the will was read, and basically people with swords turned to the priest and said, you should leave. Here's a bag of gold for your troubles. Walk quickly on the road and hope we don't catch up. So Vincent Baker, being the constant role player, decided that he won and said, see ya, and exited the game with a pile of gold. Nice. At the very end of the game, when I'm the last man standing, I go to the crazy witch, played by our friend Kat, Gethian, the crazy witch I played last time, and she's like, you can't marry my daughter unless you actually worship Thor. Which was tricky because I had claimed to be baptized like nine times and all this sort of shenanigans. So I was like, I will go murder that priest. I will catch up to him on the road and bring you back a bag of gold and his head. And Vincent Baker, who'd been sitting there like enjoying the denim on the game, turns to me and says, really? Really? And then Luke's like, we're going to play this out. To prove that you (laughs) worship Thor. So (laughs) Luke Crane made us play it out. So the final scene was he, it was like a month later. He was like getting on a boat to go to the new world and he had this bag of money and everything's going well. And I show up in his house and I'm just like, so nothing, no offense to you or your God if he answers your prayers, but I'm going to kill you and take your head and give it back to that crazy witch so I can marry her daughter. And he looks at me and I say, make whatever rituals you have to make and then I'm going to come back in the room and kill you. And it's Vincent Baker. So I'm curious how he's going to role play this. He fucking tried to stab me. (laughs) The priest at the very end had had enough of this Viking bullshit and tried to kill me. 
All right. So the mechanic Luke had for this was if you actually tried to kill someone, you had an envelope, and he never told you what it was the whole time. You try to kill someone, you open your envelope, and you find the name of the person you tried to kill, and it tells you the result. Mm -hmm. So it's basically as though you'd pre-rolled all the rolls. Mm. So he, he Luke's like, well, open your envelope and look up uh, Arvindil's name. And Vincent Baker dutifully opens the envelope, looks at it and says, and looks at it and goes, well... That was expected. <laughs> well, Rim, your character was the big, strong, dangerous guy. <laughs> the baddest of all asses. Yeah, is a bodyguard. So I imagine on most people's sheets it said if they fought you that you would win. I also had the best instinct ever. Always look for trouble. Great. <laughs> So when we were talking about, we had this whole like rap session at the end and I was like, I won and I didn't kill a single person. And Vincent looks at me and says, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, there's besides the sessions that we ran as, is a uh, law of burning. Con, yep, my game went okay. It wasn't great. I was, I there didn't run was, it as well as I could have. Yep. There was one more session I played it. And as you know, there was a beginner track. One more. I had two more. Uh, one, two. You missing a Dungeoneers. game? Engineers, am I missing a game? Because I played in a zombie apocalypse game and like modern Burning Wheel. It was a hack. It was okay. Let me see that schedule. It was pretty <laughs> fun, but I don't have anything notable to say about it except that uh, I died, and what? I died taking I think a G sixteen wound. Mm, let's see. I played in Rachel's game, Matt's game, Dungeoneer game, the beginner track game I was about to talk about, and then I ran my game. That's five. Oh. All right. All right. So, uh, the beginner track, right? So, this Burning Con featured a new feature. Featured a new feature. The beginner track. If you had not GM'd before, you could do the, the beginner's course on Saturday, and then you would be required to run a game that you've just been trained to run on Sunday. So, being all adventurous and also, you know, wanting to sort of walk the walk and say, hey, look, you know, I always say people can't learn to be GMs because they need. When they suck, no one wants to play in their game, so they can't practice and get better because no one wants to play, So they and it's a sort of catch-22. I said, I'm going to go play in a beginner track game. So I went, and actually the GM of this beginner track game was one of our listeners, and the game he ran was <laughs> not too bad. All right. The last game I played was something I'd never played before. I'm trying I to remember what happened in it. I played My in a, hit the schedule. I played in a Jeet's Lady Blackbird game. Okay. Do you know anything about Lady Blackbird? Rim's still not bringing up the schedule to help me remember. Oh, you need the schedule. That I can't remember what the game was about. I only pull it back up. I got the schedule around here I have somewhere. heard people talk about Lady Blackbird, and all I know is that it is a game where that is, uh, quote, easy to GM because uh, the players do not have to uh, do so much. Uh, so here's the deal. Lady Blackbird is steampunk the role-playing game. And the way it works, as far as I can tell, is you have traits. And under each trait, you have a bunch of things. Your character will say something like cunning. And under cunning, it has like six or seven other descriptors. You can, if you want to accomplish something, it's burning wheel style obstacles. You know, one, two, three, or four, five, six, success or failure. So what you do is you choose, you get one die because you're a person. You're you. You get one die for the trait you use, and you get one die for every one of those aspects that you also are using in attempting to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. And then you're given an obstacle. And that's the primary, like, core mechanic of the game. Now, to augment that, you have a pool of seven dice. You can draw from that pool at any time. If you fail the roll, you get all those dice back and an extra die to the pool. If you succeed at the roll, you lose all the dice you pulled from the pool. Mm -hmm. So basically, the more you fail, you build up this buffer of eventually succeeding and being awesome. Yep. Though, oftentimes, you keep failing rolls because you keep trying to do increasingly desperate things. But when you but succeed, you're back to nothing. So it's sort of like an inverse dread. So it has one other mechanic. It's very inspector's -y. If you want to refresh your pool, you can call for an aside, and you basically do the equivalent of turning to another player character and say, yeah, this is just like that time we did the whatever, and then role play a flashback. Like Arabian Nights? Yeah, or like Inspectors with the asides. It basically is a role-playing heavy game, and the dice just come out every now and then to decide if you succeed or fail. Succeeding means you get what you want, and the plot progresses. Failure just increasingly makes things desperate, and the ship is also a character. It's really, really fun, 
I played Lady Blackbird, of course, and I was told that I took a very interesting take on Lady Blackbird, and the game turned into a romantic comedy. I ended up dating the captain. Okay. Also, Lady Blackbird's a consummate bla- badass and also a wizard. Okay. In a steampunk setting. So I was like trying to use lightning to take out the security cameras. Yeah, the setting sounds a little bit uh, fan service y. No, you know what the setting is? Mm. An endless blue sky with a dying star in the middle of it and a bunch of land masses. How is that not fan service And a bunch of land masses. The ships are all airships. The evil empire is kind of like Star Wars y, Thrawn y kind of people. Again, how is it not fan service And remember when we played Air Action Weekly? <laughs> it kind of has this, yeah, there's a radio channel. Fucking everyone in the entire world can hear it. Yeah. It was great. It was oh, super so fun. I'm remembering Ajit now. Ajit is also one of the better game masters I've ever played with. Oh, and yeah. All, I talked to him a bunch. He's he cool. He is super cool and he's super good at this. And uh, some people from Inheritance were around in this game too. And I got to say, I actually talked to him at the party and he said he was like a relative nub. And I was like, what? Thing is, Lady Black. Blackbird, he he has not played most of these indie RPGs. Yeah. I felt bad. I was the one who booted him out of uh, <laughs> Inheritance. <laughs> but he, the, all you have to do to run Lady Blackbird is know how the rules work, and every time a character says something, just turn to any other character and say, how do you feel about that? Mm-hmm. How do you feel about, you're a, you're a noble, how do you feel about how the captain just kind of overruled you? <laughs> captain, how do you feel that this noble just overruled you? No, no matter if I said something or he said something, he just turned to the other person and said, how do you feel about that? Yeah, that's it a was, Luke Crane trick. Yeah, he probably worked. learned that in the beginner's track. <laughs> it works really well. He definitely learned that beginner's track, maybe. Okay, so the uh, the game I played in with the nub GM, it was this sort of typical burning wheel scenario, and the situation was that uh, there was a tomb, right? And someone... Uh, like the you know like the Lord's son had recently passed away, but we don't know why. And he was ah. in the t- he was in the tomb, <laughs> waiting. Right? We were the grave robbers, and we were gonna go rob that grave. And each of us had different reasons for wanting to rob the grave. Right? Some of us wanted to get in and out fast with treasure. Some of us wanted to get the body and bring it out. Some of us. Wanted to, you know, keep the body in there, and because there was a sorceress who was also coming to get the body, but we got there first. And like my character wanted to wait till she got there to negotiate with her, and all this stuff. And there was something creepy going on. And then it became a zombie situation where the dead were rising all over the place. And then we we're all confronting the sorceress at her palace, and you know, this sort of uh, typical town goes nuts. There's something supernatural going. How did this guy even die? What is the Lord Duke up to? Kind of situation, you know, with a lot. And the character conflict was pretty good too, because it's all like, you know, the other guy just wanted to, uh, it was like destroy the body or something. Whereas I was like, no, 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 we need to, you know, wait here for the sorcerers to show up. But I didn't say that. And I was, you know, I was trying, yeah, I was trying to delay by like letting the thievey people, I was like, yeah, let these guys steal some more treasure. Hey, maybe there's another room with more treasure to steal. Yeah, let's go, you know. And he's like, no, 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 we got to get out of here now. And I'm like, no, let's steal some more treasure. Look, there's all this gold here. It was fake gold. Uh, It was, you know, it was was, for a nub GM. He did rather well. And he was also very enthusiastic. Uh. About, you know, uh, doing better the next time and all the the advices that people were throwing out. He was like, ooh, and writing it down. So uh, I definitely feel that the beginner track was uh, very helpful and that those people at the who were beginners now at future Burning Cons will become Matt's and Rachel's of the future and you will want to sign up for their games. There were some high caliber role players. I mean, during Inheritance, mm. multiple characters broke out into legitimate mm. tears in the course of the game. Oh, People, snap. like when the will was being read, Vincent like had this quiver in his voice when a certain fact was revealed. And it the was the fact that I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's the same one. fact. It's the same fact. Yes. It's a little more nuanced because of some other bullshit. But oh. uh, let's just say when, when well, he because, read that. Well, because his character is reading it, right? Whereas the character that I played, the dwarf with the runes, when he reads it, he's was just, like, oh, these fucking humans. Oh right. My God. But if that guy reads that will, not knowing the contents. Luke made us pass the will around to check the seal. So everyone held it physically in their hands. And it had a real seal with wax. No, he didn't have a real seal. Basically, we were like. A piece of scotch tape. There were a lot of great moments, like when the prodigal son came, he went to put uh, like a burning brand into the fire of the grandfather, and Cat, who was playing Geffian, fucking knocked it out of his hand. Nice. It was it, it was so peak. That was peak. Peak. 
So the final thing to talk about is the session that I ran. Ah. Uh, or the session that you ran, but you didn't seem like you wanted to talk about it very much. I could, just we've already gone for over an hour. Oh, uh, okay. Well, let me quickly just say this about the session I ran. It was the last session. A lot of people weren't there because of Hurricane. I thought there might be no players and I could go home and watch football, which was I did get home for the end of the game, which is uh, aggravating. Um, and... At first, I only had one player, who was the beginner GM listener who really wanted to play in my game. He told me so, but no one else was in. Then I got a second player, and then out of you know, which was uh, you know, no, then the second player left, and I'm sitting here thinking football, football, because I wasn't, you know, I was confident in my session. I had increased in confidence, but my level of confidence in it had wavered over time. But funnily, there were three games in the room, and every right. GM was like, well, I'm okay and not the, running my game. Right, and the confidence that I had in my game was not at a, the maximum, so I was, I was glad not to run, right? Then suddenly... Lou Crane appears to play in my game. And I'm like, oh, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> fuck no. So then I go into the second room, right? He's like, well, if we're going to play, and I, suddenly I'm running the game with Lou Crane, and I'm like, shit. Suddenly, we go into the second room. He bails on the game. And I'm like, yes, all right. And in comes Shervin. And I was like, Shervin, what's up? All right. You know, so now I got, you know, listener, and I got Shervin. And then almost, almost as bad as Lou Crane, but not quite as bad. In comes John and Lamar, who are, what? and I'm like, oh, crap. What am I going to do now with these expert role players stepping into my game? This is not good. <laughs> In a scenario where I do not have full confidence, I've never even run a practice run. I've never done anything. And I'm sitting there thinking, right, my, basically here's the gist of my scenario that I came up with. You're in a normal-ass town. There is a monster up in the hills, a legend of a monster up in the hills. No one knows if it's really there or not, but the legend is, you know, don't go in the cave. No one's ever returned. If you go near it, there's weird noises, that whole thing. The knight, the knight, like Lancelot, famous knight throughout the realm, shows up. He says, I'm going to take care of this monster everyone's heard about. He goes off. You, the players, are four normal-ass townsfolk. The innkeeper, the steadfast innkeeper, right? You know, the one that's the NPC in all the video games. The bard who plays music in the inn. The uh, town drunk who is a shopkeeper. And a foreign merchant who has a caravan that is in town uh, and is sort of, you know, the innkeeper doesn't like it because it's, you know, business competition. So these are the four normal, boring-ass, weak-ass, normal townsfolk. And the story is the knight returns to the inn while all the four players are in it, and he's wounded, but he's carrying mad loot, big-time loot, right? And I got this idea because the previous year I played in a game that was about, I think we might have talked about it, the four players just killed the dragon and come to town with the loot. And I was thinking, what if the four players are normal people in the town and someone else comes in with the loot, right? It's sort of the opposite. Instead of the players being the people with the loot, the players are the people trying to get the loot from the player who is the knight. So... You know, I, I dropped this, these beliefs and these character sheets on these four people. That's all I dropped on them. I wasn't as prepared as Rachel. I wasn't, right? And I'm like, what am I going to do? What's going to happen? And, of course, expert role player John immediately, before I could even make the I'm thinking, all right, we got to start the game. I got to make the night show up. Before I could even make the night show up, John goes full on with the singing, <laughs> attacking the shopkeeper, trying to, he, he hit in the first, he immediately begins the game and hits all his beliefs on a single roll before anything has even happened. I'm reminded of the <laughs> moment way back when we first played the sword when Luke came, found us arguing and said, no, no, go on. That is exactly what occurred. Uh, and actually, I started running this game and it, a lot of it, I cannot deny, a significant portion of it must have been due to the excellent skills of all four of the players at the table were A-plus playing. I could not ask for easier people to run a game for, but I was actually surprised looking at myself with the third-person view uh, at the quality of my game running. I said, man, I wish I was playing in this game. I'm, why am I doing a good job? I don't know, but I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. How is this happening? So now I just kind of want to run this game for other people's because I feel good about running it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really wondering, though, could I run a campaign game that goes on as well as I was running that one-time game? You could try again. We could try to do Dwarf Fortress again. But well, I don't know if we do Dwarf Fortress. We'll do something. I like Dwarf Fortress. I really want to do Townsfolk. Because I'm liking townsfolk. I'm liking dwarves lately. I like, I'm I like townsfolk. The thing is, I'm playing it a dwarf. It proves me right that the thing I've always wanted to play was boring-ass townsfolk, and I was able to make it work 
So it was it was just like, yeah, no one else wanted to play Boring Townsfolk but me. And look, I was right. Boring Ass Townsfolk is a great game. That's what I'm saying. So. Fag. <laughs> Sadly, the after party. Uh, I, I did not go. I went to watch football. I went to the after party and then I literally rode the last train out of Dodge because the hurricane was coming in and all the subways <laughs> were closing down. I got on the last train out of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Literally like the, the like we walk up and everything's roped off. I'm like, fuck, did we miss it? And then there's this crazy guy. He wasn't crazy. He was just one of those guys. You know, anyone who talks to you in the subway who isn't an official is probably crazy. And he starts explaining what's going on, but in a kind of crazy way and how it's the government conspiracy. Like, that's why the hurricane's coming in, why they're shutting everything down, but mm -hmm. whatever. So we wait, and then, sure enough, the last train out of Dodge pulls up, and then the person in the booth turns off the light, locks the door to the booth, opens the exit door. We all walk through with her, and we all got on the train together, and we left the subway station empty, and the lights all turned off behind us. Whoa. It was awesome. So today on the subway, they're making all these announcements about the limited service, and one of the announcements, you know what the guy said on the train? What he said. He said, the end trains go to 34th Street where you can transfer to the BMT or IND. Whoa. Uh, and I, as soon as I heard that. That guy must be like seven. As soon as I heard that, I was like, how old is the dude who is freaking running this train? Because it's true. The IRT wasn't running. Yeah. <laughs> right? I was like, how old is the guy who is, you know, conducting this train or engineering this subway train? That is epic. He didn't say it again. I kept listening to his announcements to see. <laughs> he, he only said it once. He said BMT IND, and I was like, "That's how you know if someone's and I was actually like, an immortal." And vampire. I was, I was like, "Am I the only one on this train who understood what that guy just said?" And the thing is, we never lived through it. We just know it thanks to Wikipedia because and we're, attention. That's, that's the only reason I know anything. <laughs> I learned a little bit from our. IT. And I repeat that fact often. <laughs> but apparently, no one learns that. I, that's they keep thinking I'm smart. I don't know. No, Burning Con was great. If any, if any best, of you best Burning Con yet. Five excellent sessions. Past Burning Cons have had four or three. If uh, any of you did not go because you were afraid of running a game, you're shut a fool. The fuck up. I pity you, fool. <laughs> this was this was one of the better conventions I've ever been to. I played five sessions of role playing through a hurricane over two days, and all five of them. We're A plus. You can't add, you can't get that kind of shit at like fucking Gen Con. This was in New York City and it was so cheap. I, as Lady Blackbird, cast off my disguise ten seconds into the scenario and broadcast my love of the Pirate King to the world. I think I'm just gonna run my scenario straight up again next year. Watch out, you know what I'm gonna do? Hmm? Playing it. Uh, no, you can't. <laughs> well, it'll be like me, Lucrane, Tor. Not allowed. <laughs> I actually played in two games with Tor this week. It's really fun to play in a game with Tor. I've never I had. Played never... The, the shipwreck game and also the. Uh, well, we played Inheritance with him all, last you know, year. Only. I played this like mouse guard Victorian thing that he was in. Yeah, and he also played the Dungeoneers game, but the he the, he really busted out in that thief game hardcore. I was like, you know, like this one point he sort of unexpectedly busted out and I was like his character got mad angry and I was I was like whoa <laughs> watch now this has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music Cat Lee for web design and Brando K for the logos be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes discussion news and more remember Geek Nights is not one but four different shows SciTech Mondays Gaming Tuesdays Anime Comic Wednesdays and Indiscriminate Thursdays Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. 